Section 41 of The Fable of the Bees by Bernard Mandeville. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Fifth Dialogue Between Horatio and Cleomenes. Cleomenes. It excels everything. It is extremely rich without being luscious, and I know nothing to which I can compare the taste of it. To me it seems to be a collection of different fine flavors that puts me in mind of several delicious fruits, which yet are all outdone by it. Horatio, I am glad it pleased you. Cleomenes, the scent of it likewise is wonderfully reviving. As you was pairing it, a fragrancy, I thought, perfumed the room that was perfectly cordial. Horatio, the inside of the rind has an oiliness of no disagreeable smell, that upon handling of it sticks to one's fingers for a considerable time. For though now I have washed and wiped my hands, the flavor of it will not be entirely gone from them by tomorrow morning. Cleomenes. This was the third I ever tasted of our own growth. The production of them in these northern climates is no small instance of human industry, and our improvements in gardening. It is very elegant to enjoy the wholesome air of temperate regions, and at the same time be able to raise fruit to its highest maturity that naturally requires the sun of the torrid zone. Horatio. It is easy enough to procure heat, but the great art consists in finding out and regulating the degrees of it at pleasure, without which it would be impossible to ripen an ananas here, and to compass this with that exactness, as it is done by the help of thermometers, was certainly a fine invention. Cleomenes, I do not care to drink any more. Horatio, just as you please, otherwise I was going to name a health which would not have come mala propos. Cleomenes, whose is that, pray? Horatio, I was thinking on the man to whom we are in a great measure obliged for the production and culture of the exotic we were speaking of in this kingdom, Sir Matthew Decker, the first ananas or pineapple that was brought to perfection in England, grew in his garden at Richmond. Cleomenes, with all my heart, let us finish with that. He is a beneficent and, I believe, a very honest man. Horatio, it would not be easy to name another who, with the same knowledge of the world and capacity of getting money, is equally disinterested and inoffensive. Cleomenes, have you considered the things we discoursed of yesterday? Horatio, I have thought on nothing else since I saw you. This morning I went through the whole essay, and with more attention than I did formerly. I like it very well. Only that passage which you read yesterday, and some others to the same purpose, I cannot reconcile with the account we have of man's origin from the Bible, since all are descendants from Adam, and consequently of Noah and his posterity. How came savages into the world? Cleomenes the history of the world, as to very ancient times, is very imperfect. What devastations have been made by war, by pestilence, and by famine, what distress some men have been drove to, and how strangely our race has been dispersed and scattered over the earth since the flood, we do not know. Horatio, but persons that are well instructed themselves never fail of teaching their children, and we have no reason to think that knowing civilized men, as the sons of Noah were, should have neglected their offspring. But it is altogether incredible, as all are descendants from them, that succeeding generations, instead of increasing in experience and wisdom, should learn backward, and still more and more abandon their broods in such a manner as to degenerate at last to what you call the state of nature. Cleomenes, whether you intend this as a sarcasm or not, I do not know, but you have raised no difficulty that can render the truth of the sacred history suspected. Holy Writ has acquainted us with the miraculous origin of our species, and the small remainder of it after the deluge. But it is far from informing us of all the revolutions that have happened among mankind since. The Old Testament hardly touches upon any particulars that had no relation to the Jews. Neither does Moses pretend to give a full account of everything that happened to, or was transacted by our first parents. He names none of Adam's daughters, and takes no notice of several things that must have happened in the beginning of the world, as is evident from Cain's building a city, and several other circumstances, from which it is plain that Moses meddled with nothing but what was material, and to his purpose, which, in that part of his history, was to trace the descent of the patriarchs from the first man. But that there are savages is certain. Most nations of Europe have met with wild men and women in several parts of the world, 
that were ignorant of the use of letters, and among whom they could observe no rule or government. Horatio, that there are savages I do not question, and from the great number of slaves that are yearly fetched from Africa, it is manifest that in some parts there must be vast swarms of people that have not yet made a great hand of their sociableness. But how to derive them from all the sons of Noah, I own, is past my skill. Cleomenes, you find it as difficult to account for the loss of the many fine arts and useful inventions of the ancients which the world has certainly sustained. But the fault I find with Sir William Temple is in the character of his savage. Just reasoning, and such an orderly way of proceeding as he makes him act in, are unnatural to a wild man. In such a one, the passions must be boisterous and continually jostling and succeeding one another. No untaught man could have a regular way of thinking or pursue any one design with steadiness. Horatio, you have strange notions of our species, but has not a man, by the time that he comes to maturity, some notions of right and wrong that are natural? Cleomenes, before I answer your question, I would have you consider that, among savages, there must always be a great difference as to the wildness or tameness of them. All creatures naturally love their offspring whilst they are helpless, and so does man. But in the savage state, men are more liable to accidents and misfortunes than they are in society as to the rearing of their young ones, and, therefore, the children of savages must very often be put to their shifts so as hardly to remember, by the time they are grown up, that they had any parents. If this happens too early, and they are dropped or lost before they are four or five years of age, they must perish, either die for want, or be devoured by beasts of prey, unless some other creature takes care of them. Those orphans that survive, and become their own masters very young, must, when they are come to maturity, be much wilder than others, that have lived many years under the tuition of parents. Horatio, but would not the wildest man you can imagine have from nature some thoughts of justice and injustice? Cleomenes, such a one, I believe, would naturally, without much thinking in the case, take everything to be his own that he could lay his hands on. Horatio, then they would soon be undeceived if two or three of them met together. Cleomenes, that they would soon disagree and quarrel is highly probable, but I do not believe they ever would be undeceived. Horatio, at this rate, men could never be formed into an aggregate body. How came society into the world? Cleomenes, as I told you, from private families, but not without great difficulty, and the concurrence of many favorable accidents, and many generations pass before there is any likelihood of their being formed into a society. Horatio, that men are formed into societies we see, but if they are all born with that false notion, and they can never be undeceived, which way do you account for it? Cleomenes, my opinion concerning this matter is this. Self-preservation bids all creatures gratify their appetites, and that of propagating his kind never fails to affect a man in health many years before he comes to his full growth. If a wild man and a wild woman would meet very young, and live together for fifty years undisturbed, in a mild, wholesome climate, where there is plenty of provisions, they might see a prodigious number of descendants. For, in the wild state of nature, man multiplies his kind much faster than can be allowed of in any regular society. No male at fourteen would be long without a female, if he could get one, and no female of twelve would be refractory, if applied to, or remain long uncorded, if there were men. Horatio. Considering that consanguinity would be no bar among these people, the progeny of two savages might soon amount to hundreds. All this I can grant you, but as parents, no better qualified, could teach their children but little, it would be impossible for them to govern these sons and daughters when they grew up, if none of them had any notions of right or wrong. And society is as far off as ever. The false principle, which you say all men are born with, is an obstacle never to be surmounted. Cleomenes, from that false principle, as you call it, the right men naturally claim to everything they can get. It must follow that man will look upon his children as his property, and make such use of them as is most consistent with his interest. Horatio, what is the interest of a wild man that pursues nothing with steadiness? Cleomenes, the demand of the predominant passion for the time it lasts. 
Horatio, that may change every moment, and such children would be miserably managed. Cleomenes, that is true, but still managed they would be. I mean they would be kept under, and forced to do as they were bid, at least till they were strong enough to resist. Natural affection would prompt a wild man to love and cherish his child. It would make him provide food and other necessaries for his son, till he was ten or twelve years old, or perhaps longer. But this affection is not the only passion he has to gratify. If his son provokes him by stubbornness, or doing otherwise than he would have him, this love is suspended. And if his displeasure be strong enough to raise his anger, which is as natural to him as any other passion, it is ten to one but he will knock him down. If he hurts him very much, and the condition he has put his son in moves his pity, his anger will cease, and, natural affection returning, he will fondle him again, and be sorry for what he has done. Now, if we consider that all creatures hate and endeavor to avoid pain, and that benefits beget love in all that receive them, we shall find that the consequence of this management would be that the savage child would learn to love and fear his father. These two passions, together with the esteem which we naturally have for everything that far excels us, will seldom fail of producing that compound which we call reverence. Horatio, I have it now. You have opened my eyes, and I see the origin of society as plain as I do that table. Cleomenes, I am afraid the prospect is not so clear yet as you imagine. Horatio, why so? The grand obstacles are removed. Untaught men, it is true, when they are grown up, are never to be governed, and our subjection is never sincere where the superiority of the governor is not very apparent. But both these are obviated. The reverence we have for a person when we are young is easily continued as long as we live, and where authority is once acknowledged, and that acknowledgment well established, it cannot be a difficult matter to govern. If thus a man may keep up his authority over his children, he will do it still with greater ease over his grandchildren, for a child that has the least reverence for his parents will seldom refuse homage to the person to whom he sees his father pay it. Besides, a man's pride would be a sufficient motive for him to maintain the authority once gained, and, if some of his progeny proved refractory, he would leave no stone unturned, by the help of the rest, to reduce the disobedient. The old man being dead, the authority from him would devolve upon the eldest of his children, and so on. Cleomenes, I thought you would go on too fast. If the wild man had understood the nature of things, and been endued with general knowledge, and a language ready-made, as Adam was by miracle, what you say might have been easy. But an ignorant creature that knows nothing but what his own experience has taught him is no more fit to govern than he is fit to teach the mathematics. Horatio, he would not have above one or two children to govern at first, and his experience would increase by degrees as well as his family. This would require no such consummate knowledge. Cleomenes, I do not say it would. An ordinary capacity of a man tolerably well educated would be sufficient to begin with. But a man who never had been taught to curb any of his passions would be very unfit for such a task. He would make his children, as soon as they were able, assist him in getting food, and teach them how and where to procure it. Savage children, as they got strength, would endeavor to imitate every action they saw their parents do, and every sound they heard them make but all the instructions they received would be confined to things immediately necessary. Savage parents would often take offense at their children, as they grew up, without a cause, and as these increased in years, so natural affection would decrease in the other. The consequence would be that the children would often suffer for failings that were not their own. Savages would often discover faults in the conduct of what was past, but they would not be able to establish rules for future behavior, which they would approve of themselves for any continuance, and want of foresight would be an inexhaustible fund for charges in their resolutions. The savage's wife, as well as himself, would be highly pleased to see their daughters impregnated and bring forth, and they would both take great delight in their grandchildren. Horatio, I thought that in all creatures the natural affection of parents had been confined to their own young ones. Cleomenes, it is so in all but man. There is no species but ours that are so conceited of themselves as to imagine everything to be theirs. The desire of dominion is a never-failing consequence of the pride that is common to all men, 
and which the brat of a savage is as much born with as the son of an emperor. This good opinion we have of ourselves makes men not only claim a right to their children, but likewise imagine that they have a great share of jurisdiction over their grandchildren. The young ones of animals, as soon as they can help themselves, are free, but the authority which parents pretend to have over their children never ceases. How general and unreasonable this eternal claim is naturally in the heart of man, we may learn from the laws, which, to prevent the usurpation of parents and rescue children from their dominion, every civil society is forced to make, limiting paternal authority to a certain term of years. Our savage pair would have a double title to their grandchildren, from their undoubted property in each parent of them, and all the progeny being sprung from their own sons and daughters, without intermixture of foreign blood, they would look upon the whole race to be their natural vassals, and I am persuaded that the more knowledge and capacity of reasoning this first couple acquired, the more just and unquestionable their sovereignty over all their descendants would appear to them, though they should live to see the fifth or sixth generation. Horatio, is it not strange that nature should send us all into the world with a visible desire after government, and to no capacity for it at all? Cleomenes, what seems strange to you is an undeniable instance of divine wisdom, for, if all had not been born with this desire, all must have been destitute of it, and multitudes could never have been formed into societies, if some of them had not been possessed of this thirst for dominion. Creatures may commit force upon themselves, they may learn to warp their natural appetites, and divert them from their proper objects, but peculiar instincts that belong to a whole species are never to be acquired by art or discipline, and those that are born without them must remain destitute of them forever. Ducks run to the water as soon as they are hatched, but you can never make a chicken swim any more than you can teach it to suck. Horatio, I understand you very well. If pride had not been innate to all men, none of them could ever have been ambitious. And as to the capacity of governing, experience shows us that it is to be acquired. But how to bring society into the world, I know no more than the wild man himself. What you have suggested to me of his unskillfulness and want of power to govern himself has quite destroyed all the hopes I had conceived of society from this family. But would religion have no influence upon them? Pray, how came that into the world? Cleomenes, from God, by miracle. Horatio, obscurum por obscurius. I do not understand miracles that break in upon and subvert the order of nature, and I have no notion of things that come to pass in dépit de bon sens, and are such that judging from sound reason and known experience, all wise men would think themselves mathematically sure that they could happen. Cleomenes, it is certain that by the word miracle is meant an interposition of the divine power when it deviates from the common course of nature. Horatio, as when matters easily combustible remain whole and untouched in the midst of a fire fiercely burning, or lions in vigor industriously kept hungry forbear eating what they are most greedy after. These miracles are strange things. Cleomenes, they are not pretended to be otherwise. The etymology of the word imports it, but it is almost as unaccountable that men should disbelieve them and pretend to be of a religion that is altogether built upon miracles. Horatio, but when I asked you that general question, why did you confine yourself to revealed religion? Cleomenes, because nothing, in my opinion, deserves the name of religion that has not been revealed. The Jewish was the first that was national, and the Christian the next. Horatio, but Abraham, Noah, and Adam himself were no Jews, and yet they had religion. Cleomenes, no other than what was revealed to them. God appeared to our first parents and gave them commands immediately after he had created them. The same intercourse was continued between the supreme being and the patriarchs, but the father of Abraham was an idolater. Horatio, but the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans had religion as well as the Jews. Cleomenes, their gross idolatry and abominable worship I call superstition. Horatio, you may be as partial as you please, but they all called their worship religion as well as we do ours. You say, man brings nothing with him but his passions, and when I asked you how religion came into the world, I meant what is there in man's nature that is not acquired, from which he has a tendency to religion. 
What is it that disposes him to it? Cleomenes. Fear. Horatio. How? Primus in orbe deus fecit timor. Are you of that opinion? Cleomenes. No man upon earth less. But that noted Epicurean axiom, which irreligious men are so fond of, is a very poor one, and it is silly, as well as impious to say, that fear made a god. You may as justly say, that fear made grass, or the sun and the moon. But when I am speaking of savages, it is not clashing either with good sense, nor the Christian religion, to assert that, whilst such men are ignorant of the true deity, and yet very defective in the art of thinking and reasoning, fear is the passion that first gives them an opportunity of entertaining some glimmering notions of an invisible power, which afterwards, as by practice and experience they grow greater proficience, and become more perfect in the labor of the brain, and the exercise of their highest faculty, will infallibly lead them to the certain knowledge of an infinite and eternal being, whose power and wisdom will always appear the greater, and more stupendous to them, the more they themselves advance in knowledge and penetration, though both should be carried on to a much higher pitch than it is possible for our limited nature ever to arrive at. Horatio, I beg your pardon for suspecting you, though I am glad it gave you an opportunity of explaining yourself. The word fear, without any addition, sounded very harsh, and even now I cannot conceive how an invisible cause should become the object of man's fear, that should be so entirely untaught as you have made the first savage. Which way can anything invisible, and that affects none of the senses, make an impression upon a wild creature? Cleomenes, every mischief and every disaster that happens to him, of which the cause is not very plain and obvious, excessive heat and cold, wet and drought that are offensive, thunder and lightning, even when they do no visible hurt, noises in the dark, obscurity itself, and everything that is frightful and unknown, are all administering and contributing to the establishment of this fear. The wildest man that can be conceived, by the time that he came to maturity, would be wise enough to know that fruits and other eatables are not to be had, either always or everywhere. This would naturally put him upon hoarding, when he had good store. His provisions might be spoiled by the rain. He would see that trees were blasted, and yielded not always the same plenty. He might not always be in health, or his young ones might grow sick and die, without any wounds or external force to be seen. Some of these accidents might at first escape his attention, or only alarm his weak understanding, without occasioning much reflection for some time, but as they come often, he would certainly begin to suspect some invisible cause, and, as his experience increased, be confirmed in his suspicion. It is likewise highly probable that a variety of different sufferings would make him apprehend several such causes, and at last induce him to believe that there was a great number of them which he had to fear. What would very much contribute to this credulous disposition, and naturally lead him into such a belief, is a false notion we imbibe very early, and which we may observe in infants, as soon as by their looks, their gestures, and the signs they make, they begin to be intelligible to us. Horatio, what is that, pray? Cleomenes, all young children seem to imagine that everything thinks and feels in the same manner as they do themselves, and that they generally have this wrong opinion of things inanimate is evident from a common practice among them, whenever they labor under any misfortune which their own wildness and want of care have drawn upon them. In all such cases, you see them angry at and strike a table, a chair, the floor, or anything else that can seem to have been accessory to their hurting themselves, or the production of any other blunder they have committed. Nurses we see, in compliance to their frailty, seem to entertain the same ridiculous sentiments, and actually appease wrathful brats by pretending to take their part. Thus you will often see them very serious, and scolding at and beating either the real object of the baby's indignation, or something else, on which the blame of what has happened may be thrown, with any show of probability. It is not to be imagined that this natural folly should be so easily cured in a child that is destitute of all instruction and commerce with his own species, as it is in those that are brought up in society, and hourly improved by conversing with others that are wiser than themselves. And I am persuaded that a wild man would never get entirely rid of it whilst he lived. Horatio, I cannot think so meanly of human understanding. Cleomenes, 
Whence came the dryads and hamadryads? How came it ever to be thought impious to cut down or even to wound large venerable oaks or other stately trees? And what root did the divinity spring from, which the vulgar among the ancient heathens apprehended to be in rivers and fountains? Horatio, from the roguery of designing priests and other impostors that invented those lies and made fables for their own advantage. Cleomenes, but still it must have been want of understanding, and a tincture, some remainder of that folly which is discovered in young children, that could induce or would suffer men to believe those fables. Unless fools actually had frailties, knaves could not make use of them. Horatio, there may be something in it, but, be that as it will, you have owned that man naturally loves those he receives benefits from. Therefore, how comes it that man, finding all the good things he enjoys to proceed from an invisible cause, his gratitude should not sooner prompt him to be religious than his fear? Cleomenes, there are several substantial reasons why it does not. Man takes everything to be his own, which he has from nature. Sowing and reaping, he thinks, deserve a crop, and whatever he has the least hand in is always reckoned to be his. Every art and every invention, as soon as we know them, are our right and property, and whatever we perform by the assistance of them is, by the courtesy of the species itself, deemed to be our own. We make use of fermentation and all the chemistry of nature, without thinking ourselves beholden to anything but our own knowledge. She that churns the cream makes the butter, without inquiring into the power by which the thin lymphatic particles are forced to separate themselves and slide away from the more unctuous. In brewing, baking, cooking, and almost everything we have a hand in, nature is the drudge that makes all the alterations and does the principal work, yet all, forsooth, is our own. From all which it is manifest that man, who is naturally for making everything center in himself, must, in his wild state, have a great tendency and be very prone to look upon everything he enjoys as his due, and everything he meddles with as his own performance. It requires knowledge and reflection, and a man must be pretty far advanced in the art of thinking justly and reasoning consequentially before he can, from his own light and without being taught, be sensible of his obligations to God. The less a man knows, and the more shallow his understanding is, the less he is capable either of enlarging his prospect of things or drawing consequences from the little which he does know. Raw, ignorant, and untaught men fix their eyes on what is immediately before, and seldom look further than, as it is vulgarly expressed, the length of their noses. The wild man, if gratitude moved him, would much sooner pay his respects to the tree he gathers his nuts from than he would think of an acknowledgment to him who had planted it, and there is no property so well established, but a civilized man would suspect his title to it sooner than a wild one would question the sovereignty he has over his own breath. Another reason why fear is an elder motive to religion than gratitude is that an untaught man would never suspect that the same cause which he received good from would ever do him hurt, and evil, without doubt, would always gain his attention first. Horatio Men, indeed, seem to remember one ill turn that has served them better than ten good ones, one month's sickness better than ten years' health. Cleomenes, in all the labors of self-preservation, man is intent on avoiding what is hurtful to him. But in the enjoyment of what is pleasant, his thoughts are relaxed, and he is void of care. He can swallow a thousand delights, one after another, without asking questions. But the least evil makes him inquisitive whence it came, in order to shun it. It is very material, therefore, to know the cause of evil, but to know that of good, which is always welcome, is of little use, that is, such a knowledge seems not to promise any addition to his happiness. When a man once apprehends such an invisible enemy, it is reasonable to think that he would be glad to appease and make him his friend if he could find him out. It is highly probable, likewise, that in order to do this he would search, investigate, and look everywhere about him and that finding all his inquiries upon earth in vain, he would lift up his eyes to the sky. Horatio, and so a wild man might, and look down and up again long enough before he would be the wiser. I can easily conceive that a creature must labor under great perplexities when it actually fears something of which it knows neither what it is nor where it is, and that, 
Though a man had all the reason in the world to think it invisible, he would still be more afraid of it in the dark than when he could see. Cleomenes, whilst a man is but an imperfect thinker, and wholly employed in furthering self-preservation in the most simple manner, and removing the immediate obstacles he meets with in that pursuit, this affair, perhaps, affects him but little, but when he comes to be a tolerable reasoner, and has leisure to reflect, it must produce strange chimeras and surmises, and a wild couple would not converse together long, before they would endeavor to express their minds to one another concerning this matter, and, as in time they would invent and agree upon, certain sounds of distinction for several things, of which the ideas would often occur, so I believe that this invisible cause would be one of the first which they would coin a name for. A wild man and a wild woman would not take less care of their helpless brood than other animals, and it is not to be imagined, but the children that were brought up by them, though without instruction or discipline, would, before they were ten years old, observe in their parents this fear of an invisible cause. It is incredible likewise, considering how much men differ from one another in features, complexion, and temper, that all should form the same idea of this cause, from whence it would follow that as soon as any considerable number of men could intelligibly converse together, it would appear that there were different opinions among them concerning the invisible cause, the fear and acknowledgment of it being universal, and man always attributing his own passions to everything which he conceives to think. Everybody would be solicitous to avoid the hatred and ill-will, and, if it was possible, to gain the friendship of such a power. If we consider these things, and what we know of the nature of man, it is hardly to be conceived that any considerable number of our species could have any intercourse together long, in peace or otherwise, but willful lies would be raised concerning this power, and some would pretend to have seen or heard it. How different opinions about invisible power may, by the malice and deceit of impostors, be made the occasion of mortal enmity among multitudes is easily accounted for. If we want rain very much, and I can be persuaded that it is your fault we have none, there needs greater cause to quarrel. And nothing has happened in the world of priestcraft or inhumanity, folly or abomination, on religious accounts, that cannot be solved or explained with the least trouble from these data, and the principle of fear. Horatio, I think I must yield to you that the first motive of religion among savages was fear, but you must allow me in your turn that from the general thankfulness that nations have always paid to their gods for signal benefits and success, the many hecatombs that have been offered after victories, and the various institutions of games and festivals, it is evident that when men came to be wiser and more civilized, the greatest part of their religion was built upon gratitude. Cleomenes, you labor hard, I see, to vindicate the honor of our species, but we have no such cause to boast of it and I shall demonstrate to you that a well-weighed consideration and a thorough understanding of our nature will give us much less reason to exult in our pride than it will furnish us with for the exercise of our humility. In the first place, there is no difference between the original nature of a savage and that of a civilized man. They are both born with fear, and neither of them, if they have their senses about them, can live many years but an invisible power will, at one time or other, become the object of that fear, and this will happen to every man, whether he be wild and alone, or in society, and under the best discipline. We know by experience that empires, states, and kingdoms may excel in arts and sciences, politeness, and all worldly wisdom, and at the same time be slaves to the grossest idolatry, and submit to all the inconsistencies of a false religion. The most civilized people have been as foolish and absurd in sacred worship as it is possible for any savages to be, and the first have often been guilty of studied cruelties, which the latter would never have thought of. The Carthaginians were a subtle flourishing people, an opulent and formidable nation, and Hannibal had half conquered the Romans, when still to their idols they sacrificed the children of their chief nobility, and, as to private persons, there are innumerable instances in the most polite ages of men of sense and virtue that have entertained the most miserable, unworthy, and extravagant notions of the Supreme Being. 
what confused and unaccountable apprehensions must not some men have had of providence to act as they did alexander severus who succeeded heliogabalus was a great reformer of abuses and thought to be as good a prince as his predecessor was a bad one in his palace he had an oratory a cabinet set aside for his private devotion where he had images of apollonius tyannus orpheus abraham jesus christ and such like gods says his historian what makes you smile horatio to think how industrious priests are in concealing a man's failings when they would have you think well of him what you say of severus i have read before when looking one day for something in morere i happened to cast my eye on the article of that emperor where no mention is made either of orpheus or apollonius which remembering the passage in lampridius i wondered at and thinking that i might have been mistaken i again consulted that author where i found it as you have related it i do not question but morari left this out on purpose to repay the civilities of the emperor of the christians whom he tells us severus had been very favorable to cleomenes that is not impossible in a roman catholic but what i would speak to in the second place is the festivals you mentioned the hecatombs after victories and the general thankfulness of nations to their gods i desire you would consider that in sacred matters as well as all human affairs there are rites and ceremonies and many demonstrations of respect to be seen that the outward appearance seem to proceed from gratitude which upon due examination will be found to have been originally the result of fear at what time the floral games were first instituted is not well known but they never were celebrated every year constantly before a very unseasonable spring put the senate upon the decree that made them annual to make up the true compound of reverence or veneration love and esteem are as necessary ingredients as fear but the latter alone is capable of making men counterfeit both the former as is evident from the duties that are outwardly paid to tyrants at the same time that inwardly they are execrated and hated idolaters have always behaved themselves to every invisible cause they adored as men do to a lawless arbitrary power when they reckon it as captious haughty and unreasonable as they allow it to be sovereign unlimited and irresistible what motive could the frequent repetitions of the same solemnities spring from whenever it was suspected that the least holy trifle had been omitted you know how often the same farce was once acted over again because after every performance there was still room to apprehend that something had been neglected do but consult i beg of you and call to mind your own reading cast your eyes on the infinite variety of ideas men have formed to themselves and the vast multitude of divisions they have made of the invisible cause which every one imagines to influence human affairs run over the history of all ages look into every considerable nation their straits and calamities as well as victories and successes the lives of great generals and other famous men their adverse fortune and prosperity mind at which times their devotion was most fervent when oracles were most consulted and on what accounts the gods were most frequently addressed do but calmly consider everything you can remember relating to superstition whether grave ridiculous or execrable and you will find in the first place that the heathens and all that have been ignorant of the true deity though many of them were persons otherwise of great knowledge fine understanding and tried probity have represented their gods not as wise benign equitable and merciful but on the contrary as passionate revengeful capricious and unrelenting beings not to mention the abominable vices and gross immoralities the vulgar were taught to ascribe to them in the second that for every one instance that men have addressed themselves to an invisible cause from a principle of gratitude there are a thousand in every false religion to convince you that divine worship and men's submission to heaven have always proceeded from their fear the word religion itself and the fear of god are synonymous and had man's acknowledgment been originally founded in love as it is in fear the craft of impostors could have made no advantage of their passion and all their boasted acquaintance with gods and goddesses would have been useless to them if men had worshipped the immortal powers as they call their idols out of gratitude horatio 
All lawgivers and leaders of people gained their point and acquired what they expected from those pretenses, which is reverence, and which to produce you have owned yourself, love and esteem, to be as requisite as fear. Cleomenes, but from the laws they imposed on men, and the punishments they annexed to the breach and neglect of them, it is easily seen which of the ingredients they most relied upon. Horatio, it would be difficult to name a king or other great man, in very ancient times, who attempted to govern an infant nation that laid no claim to some commerce or other with an invisible power, either held by himself or his ancestors. Between them and Moses there was no other difference than that he alone was a true prophet and really inspired, and all the rest were impostors. Cleomenes, what would you infer from this? Horatio, that we can say no more for ourselves than what men of all parties and persuasions have done in all ages, every one for their cause, viz., that they alone were in the right, and all that differed from them in the wrong. Cleomenes, is it not sufficient that we can say this of ourselves with truth and justice, after the strictest examination, when no other cause can stand any test or bear the least inquiry? A man may relate miracles that never were wrought, and give an account of things that never happened, but a thousand years hence all-knowing men will agree that nobody could have wrote Sir Isaac Newton's Principia unless he had been a great mathematician. When Moses acquainted the Israelites with what had been revealed to him, he told them a truth which nobody then upon earth knew but himself. Horatio, you mean the unity of God, and his being the author of the universe. Cleomenes, I do so. Horatio, but is not every man of sense capable of knowing this from his reason? Cleomenes, yes, when the art of reasoning consequentially is come to that perfection which it has been arrived at these several hundred years, and himself has been led into the method of thinking justly, every common sailor could steer a course to the midst of the ocean as soon as the use of the lodestone and the mariner's compass were invented, but before that the most expert navigator would have trembled at the thoughts of such an enterprise. When Moses acquainted and imbued the posterity of Jacob with this sublime and important truth, they were degenerated into slaves attached to the superstition of the country they dwelled in, and the Egyptians, their masters, though they were great proficients in many arts and sciences, and more deeply skilled in the mysteries of nature than any other nation then was, had the most abject and abominable notions of the deity which it is possible to conceive and no savages could have exceeded their ignorance and stupidity as to the supreme being, the invisible cause that governs the world. He taught the Israelites a priori, and their children, before they were nine or ten years old, knew what the greatest philosophers did not attain to, by the light of nature, till many ages after. End of section 41